uh, the defense knows that the mother of the defendant will be called and the mother will testify that the, uh, the child used to kill animals for fun and that the defense attorney believes it's quite possible it will be allowed in as an exception to uh, character evidence rules then the defense attorney might say look I will stipulate my client will stipulate to the fact that he killed animals when he was young it can still be entered into evidence but it will not be entered through testimony so if the mother were put on the stand and asked uh, your child used to kill animals for fun didn't he then the defense will object objection your honor repetitive duplicative why because it's already been stipulated that that answer is yes but we don't want the mother on the stand crying going yes he was such a bad child da, 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 da. you know that will affect the jury a lot more than reading stipulation the uh, as a kid the child uh, the defendant used to kill animals for, for sport or, or something like that there's a lot less emotion involved involved in that than um, than listening to a mother crying about how horrible her child was as a, as a child or her kid was as a child so motions and limiting we're talking about stipulations or um, preventing evidence altogether from being brought up that uh, that may actually be brought up it can also include a request ahead of time to allow evidence to be used. Uh, if there's something exceptional, like if the jury needs to go to a particular place to see something, it'll usually be requested ahead of time during a motion in limine so that the judge can rule at that point whether or not uh, it's worth the trouble of bringing the jury to a location to see something. All right, so that's motion and limine. Now we're going to go to opening statement. And the rest of the trial actually moves pretty quickly. There's not going to be as much to talk about in, in the rest of it as there is for that opening part. Opening statements. Again, it's not an argument. In fact, if there is an argument, it's breaking the golden rule. You will hear statements about the future. Uh, you will hear testimony from the mother of the defendant. You will hear, uh, you will see evidence of this. You will hear this. You will, will, will. If you hear you will, it's likely an opening statement. You, the jury, will dot, dot, dot. That's a good opening statement. A lot of uh, good attorneys, good trial practice, uh, provide themes. You know, we hear with the OJ case, uh, if the glove don't fit, you must acquit. That sort of, uh, sort of uh, capturing the issue in this nice little phrase helps create a theme that can be progressed throughout the, uh, throughout the trial. And you might first hear it as a juror in opening statements. You might hear, you know, I'd like to start this trial off by just mentioning our theme, which is 
If the glove don't fit, you must acquit. And the reason I use that theme is for a few reasons. You will hear testimony about the glove. You'll hear testimony from the police where they retrieved the glove, how they retrieved the glove. You'll also hear testimony from an expert who measured my client's hands. You'll hear that those hands aren't the same size as the glove. And in the end, you'll hear that that is a huge part of the prosecution's case that they can't prove or something to that effect. And, you know, I switched to criminal law right there, but the idea is that during opening statements, just because they're statements doesn't mean you can't include an argument in there, but it's distinctly statements rather than arguments. It's distinctly you will hear with uh, maybe an infusion of your theme in there. Each attorney will have the opportunity to make an opening statement. And then after the opening statements, the, um, the meat of the trial begins. We start off with the plaintiff's case. The plaintiff has to prove his case. That's the purpose of the trial. To say to a court, court, I want this. You can provide me this. So now I have the opportunity to prove to you, court, that this is the truth. And you, jury, are going to find factually that I'm right. During the plaintiff's case, the plaintiff will call witnesses. Will enter exhibits into evidence. That might be a stipulation, for instance, that was entered in before. The witnesses that the plaintiff calls, and the same thing will be true in the defense's case, which we'll look at in a second, those witnesses are going to be uh, whoever's case it is is witnesses. So in this case, the witness called will be the plaintiff's witness. A party will call a witness who is beneficial to their side, who is not going to be hostile, who's not for the opposing side. The plaintiff uh, will call witnesses that are likely going to agree and freely give out information that will help the plaintiff's side. You leave it for the other side to bring up witnesses that are against your side and then you will have the opportunity, the attorney will have the opportunity to, uh, to cross-examine them and try to uh, mitigate any damage they may cause to your side. So witnesses are called and those witnesses testify. Because this is it's direct examination, the questions are broad questions. Who, what, when, where, why, how. Uh, they are not leading questions. You're trying to get the information out of the uh, witnesses. You're trying to coax the information out. You're not trying to get them to answer a simple yes or no question, except for the preliminary things. You know. Uh, what's your name? Your date of birth is 9.50, isn't it? Those sort of preliminary things are fine to move things along. But once you get the preliminary information out, you're not going to be allowed to say things like, you were at the, the scene of the incident, weren't you? No, that would be leading. 
Rather, the question would be, 